Good morning, uh, or good afternoon, or good evening, uh, depending on where you are right now or when you're watching this. My name is Jay Shamba. I'm the director of the Institute for International Economic Policy here at George Washington University, or IIAP, as we call it. And we at IAP are very pleased to be hosting this event on equitable action for climate change, um, part of our Envisioning India series. For those of you who don't know us, IAP is located at the Elliott School at GW and is a cross-school interdisciplinary research center. We aim to serve as a catalyst for high quality multidisciplinary research on policy issues surrounding economic globalization. Uh, that's a mandate we interpret rather broadly. Um, and so we support research in international trade, international finance, international development, poverty studies, climate change, inequality and economic policy more broadly. We also have uh, had quite a focus on economic policy issues surrounding China's economy and India's economy over the last decade. We've been quite busy at IAP lately, and so please look at our website for upcoming events, or for that matter, you can look at the website or our YouTube channel to find recordings of prior events, including those in this Envisioning India series, if there are any that you missed and would like to take a look at. I'd like to acknowledge the support of the IAP Executive Circle and welcome any members in attendance. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to IAP Distinguished Visiting Scholar, Ajay Chipper, to introduce the series and today's event. Thank you so much, Jay, and thank you all for coming and joining us. So today we have a, we have a topic, uh, a, a climate on climate change, uh, in which we uh, have a very stellar cast of experts who know India well, but also know uh, the rest of the world very well. And it's very appropriate because climate change is certain, I mean, India will have a major effect uh, on not only what, what happens in India, but all around the world and certainly on climate change uh, that is uh, uh, for certainly true. So I'm going to not uh, read all their CVs, uh, you have them. But I'm going to go a little bit in reverse order here. Let me first introduce uh, Professor Shrikant Gupta. He's the professor at the Delhi School of Economics, University of Delhi. He's also the president of the Indian Society for Ecological Economics and the associate editor of the Indian Economic Review, which is the journal that comes out of the Delhi School of Economics. And he, as you can see from his CV, he has been uh, very heavily involved also in uh, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on uh, Climate uh, uh, Change, where he has been a lead author of several of their uh, reports. For, uh, for me, uh, the most important thing is that he is at the Delhi School of Economics, which is my alma mater, and uh, where whatever little economics I know, I learned there, not so much in the classroom, but in the coffee shop of the Delhi School of Economics. So welcome, uh, Shrikant. Uh, and then we have uh, Amar Bhattacharya. He is a very good friend of mine, and we've been working together at the World Bank for many years, where he had a very distinguished career. But then from there, he went on to even bigger and better things. He's the, now the senior fellow uh, at the Global Economy Development Program at Brookings. He's a visiting professor in practice at the London School of Economics and co-lead of the Sustainable Growth and Finance Initiative of the New Climate Economy under the Global Commission on the Economy and Climate. And I know he was very active in the recent COP meeting in Glasgow and produced a paper with Nick Stern uh, there, which, which, which was very highly regarded. He's also led uh, uh, the UN uh, uh, Commission on Climate, Expert Group on Climate Finance. Um, so, you know, he's uh, certainly very well versed with climate finance issues. So welcome, Amar. And then of course I have uh, the stars of our show today, uh, Jyoti and Kirit Parikh. Uh, you know, if you look at their CVs, this is just uh, in, in incredibly stellar CVs. Both of them have. Uh, Jyoti has, is now the executive director of Irade, which is this new um, think tank that uh, Jyoti and Kirit have established. Um, 
She has been on the Prime Minister's Council on Climate Change. And uh, she and Kirith were part of the IPCC team that uh, got the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, and so she is and certainly one of the best uh, in um, energy and environment economics uh, uh, economists that I have ever met. Uh, so welcome to you, Jyoti. And then, of course, Kirith uh, Parikh is, uh, is the um, uh, is uh, the chairman of the of Irade, uh, the, of which Jyoti is the executive director. He has been given the Padma Bhushan, which is the third highest civilian award by the president of India. He has been economic advisory councils of so many prime ministers that I won't even mention them all. He's also a member of the planning commission. Most importantly, Kirit and Parikh and I met in 1979 when I was a graduate student at Stanford and Kirit uh, was heading a very big program in uh, IASA in Vienna and offered me my first summer job at IASA. So that's how far back we go. Uh, he has also established the a very prestigious think tank in India uh, the, um, uh, uh, by the, IG, it's called IGIDR, and he was the founding director of IGIDR. So welcome to you, Jyoti and Kirit, and without much further ado, we are in for a treat today. I turn it over to you. Uh, who, I guess, Jyoti, you would go first, or Kirit? Uh, yeah, I would start first, yeah. Mm -hmm. Over to you. So, so uh, you are seeing the screen? Yes, Jyoti, yes. Yeah, good. So, uh, thank you very much, Ajay, and uh, also IIEP and uh, Jay Shanbak and others uh, who have made it, made it possible for us to get together and talk about uh, uh, climate change. Um, and I thank Kyle and so, uh, uh, Amar and uh, Shrikant also for being here. Uh, so we will begin today uh, about uh, equitable global action for climate change and also why and how to raise climate finance. Uh, so just a little bit, uh, some words about my, our in institution, in Integrated Research and Action for Development. We have uh, thematic areas like sustainable urban development, energy and power systems, climate change and environment, agriculture and food security, poverty alleviation and gender. And we also have an Asia Center for Sustainable Development, which uh, uh, works with uh, other Asian countries and especially South Asia power trade and so on. Uh, Irade has just completed, uh, will complete this year 20 years. And since its inception, we've been working with various uh, ministries and, and of course, a lot of international organizations as well. Um, so I would first give a little bit background of the people who have not yet, uh, uh, you may not be familiar with this uh, uh, basic statistics. Um, so uh, it's, uh, Total CO2 emissions, uh, I just took four uh, major uh, con uh, countries, one EU is a region, uh, to compare India with, so that you can see uh, what is uh, happening. Um, in 1990, this was the situation. And since then, um, uh, India has grown uh, somewhat, but you can also see that uh, China has crossed and almost become double the United States uh, in terms of uh, total emissions. Um, and um, if you go to per capita emissions, India is much, much lower. And what is interesting is that in 1990, we had Rio Convention, which uh, asked the developed countries to go back to 1990 levels in 2000. And it's, we are in 2020, and there is uh, nobody has gone to 1990, well, EU has, and uh, so, uh, it, uh, but the US just is beginning to get there. Um, and what is important is the accumulated emissions. How much have we all emitted over the years? Because what uh, determines the GH, greenhouse gas GHG effect is um, 
total emissions in the atmosphere. Uh, carbon dioxide has a lifetime of 100 years, so it accumulates. And uh, so uh, in that sense, the bur global burden is 300 by China, 220 by U US, and so on. And India is 87. Uh, we can also see world average per capita in the, this second term here, the second uh, graph here, the, the black one. And uh, we could see that India, the world average is 4.4 uh, and India is 1.7 uh, now. So it is way below global per capita average. Um, you'd also like to see, uh, I mean, all the other data apart from CO2 uh, is the uh, GDP, uh, the economic status and uh, socio-demographic uh, economic uh, indicators. And here is the uh, India with GDP per capita. In human development index, we have done, uh, we still have a long way to go. And uh, population is now getting close to China. And poverty is, uh, is something that we have to uh, re remove by 2030, according to the uh, Sustainable Development Goal commitments. So what I'm trying to say is that India has to, uh, Bridge the development deficit uh, while decarbonizing at the same time. So it's a double duty that India has to do. And uh, India is willing to play its part, it has taken many climate friendly actions and announced at Glasgow uh, future uh, goals, uh, which, have, which are slightly higher than it committed at uh, Paris uh, in 2015, uh, which will, uh, where it, where uh, actually, PM Modi said net zero emission will reach by 2070, and by 2030, which was the Paris Agreement date, uh, 500 gigawatt uh, of non-fossil generation capacity, 50% of total energy use for renewables, uh, India's net generation uh, sink capacity will be about 1 GAT GT increase. Uh, uh, it's a it's called net generation, which is the same thing as it increase. Emission intensity lower by 45% emission intensity is CO2 for GDP. We cannot reduce the GDP, but uh, we can always reduce the CO2 for GDP. And so uh, as we increase our GDP, uh, CO2 does not increase in the same proportion. That's the idea. India will need technology and finance for this. Um, what we have seen is the inequity in many forms. In adaptation, those who have not emitted much uh, suffer the most. In mitigation, those in need to grow do not have carbon space to grow as the uh, other countries did uh, when they were growing. Uh, in global neg negotiations, there needs to be certain language, certain metrics which are not quite right, we feel. Uh, and for example, um, uh, Oh, sorry. Um, people talk about emission growth. They look at, oh, India is rising from 0.6 uh, gigatons to 1.7 gigaton, but they don't see uh, uh, that what is the accumulated emissions or what is the per capita emissions uh, and um, or, or this type of uh, uh, other, other thing is differences in socioeconomic and GDP level that mandate different path. So at Glasgow, uh, people also talked about phasing out coal, but what we should be agnostics about oil, gas, or coal, no, no matter how we reduce the emissions. And India is trying very hard to reduce oil and gas emissions. But nevertheless, coal is also very much on the cards, uh, but a little bit later, uh, like 2000. Some people say we should do it right now, but I think it may happen after 2030, more actions. Um, so uh, coming back to uh, uh, some details now. Uh, so I mentioned adaptation, which means the need to deal with climate change, which is already happening. And I said the people who don't, haven't emitted suffer the most. So here are these people trying to deal with floods and uh, uh, well, the cyclone in Shakhapatnam, uh, floods in Jammu and Kashmir, Chennai floods, and so on. Every time um, uh, these people have uh, uh, problems. And uh, we're talking about huge sums of losses, $7 billion for uh, 
Shakapatnam, 16 million, 16 billion for uh, Jammu Kashmir, 4 billion, Kerala floods, 3 billion, Chennai, etc. And then we have also in our urban group uh, done the disaster analysis, climate disasters, and what is the exposure level today uh, over the last 30 years, what kind of uh, uh, disasters have occurred. And one finds that um, these are all not metro, but 1 million plus cities, uh, and uh, some are 2 million and more. Uh, so Ahmedabad, uh, Bhopal, all these countries have floods, uh, cities have floods problem, uh, water scarcity, uh, heat stress is there in all of them. Um, uh, cold wave, of course, in the Himalayan city of uh, Dehradun, uh, and so on. So uh, all this has to be uh, dealt with uh, also, and quite a lot is uh, because of the urban infrastructure is missing, and uh, this, this also call for uh, funds. So we are talking about finance for adaptation as well. So now we, uh, we have also done um, analysis, world-wise analysis. This is the Hyderabad world-wise analysis, Srinagar world-wise analysis, and we find uh, which, uh, which wards are more susceptible to uh, hazards. So coming to the to mitigation, uh, reducing the greenhouse gas emissions, uh, uh, let me say that we have already began to begin to, begin to leapfrog to uh, LED bulbs, uh, electric vehicles, solar capacity, increased uh, energy efficiency, uh, and as reduced costs of renewable power opens up uh, new possibilities, we have been trying to grab as much as we can. Uh, however, can India live also full commit, uh, com complete its uh, development deficit and achieve sustainable development goals as well while decarbonizing? So these are all uh, uh, challenges. Uh, what is a fair share of India in global carbon budget? So we should now speak about uh, carbon budgets, carbon space, uh, and that uh, I'll just come to that a little bit later on on that issue about carbon space. But um, uh, I background on Irade engagement as well as I think ministry actually I should say. Uh, Ministry of Environment and Climate Change funded few modeling studies uh, to determine what should be the Paris uh, uh, NDC. Uh, and there was another, Terry, uh, uh, so many of you must know about it. Uh, after our model results and discussions with several ministries, uh, uh, and uh, uh, they, they discussed them, and this was the uh, commitment. Uh, made at Paris Agreement, 33% of reduction in emission intensities and that non-fossil fuel capacity by 2030. Uh, Post-Paris targets uh, were then uh, uh, also we were told to extend it to 2050 uh, because uh, it's not uh, enough to just talk about 2030 and whether the uh, it's a stable uh, trends. They have, st you know, stable trends. Consultation with number of ministries were done, and then they had commit, uh, committed this Paris, uh, this uh, goal, uh, uh, national development, nationally determined contribution goal. Um, so, uh, and that we had done with uh, Irade model, uh, about which I'm coming to next. Um, uh, so, features of the Irade, so, sorry, this is uh, now a little bit getting technical. The next three four slides, I'll again go back to the uh, what other people can understand, but I understand this is a mixed audience of uh, both types, so we should uh, try to meet that dynamic uh, activity analysis optimization model. Uh, it is a, uh, it has um, it minimizes private consumption over 2015 to 2050 time range. 25 uh, economic economy is represented by 25 goods and service sectors. Uh, produced by 45 activities because uh, 11 activities are just for producing electricity in various ways. And uh, our demand is uh, uh, determ determined by model with 10 rural and 10 urban consumer classes uh, with a demand system of each class. Technical progress uh, re uh, is represented by uh, capital ratios and efficiency. Okay. Um, uh, 
this is just I'm skipping a minute. I just show broad sectors. Uh, agriculture sectors, industry sectors, services, substrate sectors. And in the, uh, we have also in energy sector, uh, oil, oil, gas, and coal, but uh, um, a number of ways one can make, that, uh, one can generate electricity because uh, electrification is going to really be a major uh, uh, tool to decarbonize uh, and um, it is to replace coal, to replace elect uh, oil, and so on, would be done by electricity. These are the, uh, the rural in, uh, income classes and urban income class uh, expenditure classes. And you could see um, they have uh, the, sh the shares kind of, uh, they, they change uh, as in when the income, uh, income increases, the uh, food grain share declines. And in fact, in urban, it disappears uh, altogether and other expenses take over. So here is the, uh, I was talking about carbon space, carbon budget. So here is the uh, 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 curve for IPCC, I mean, uh, given by the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, they have uh, uh, got together and uh, put many modeling scenarios and they say here is how we grew all this time and now uh, and uh, if we had not had Paris agreement we would have shoot gone off this uh, orange way but after Paris we have turned around slightly uh, and uh, we will be going into into this zone uh, however what we need to do for two degree uh, temperature is to go to this uh, and if it is 1.5 it's even sharper term. And all that has to happen for the globe as a whole, not necessarily for a given country, but for, uh, between 2015 and not even 2030 has to be finished by 2025. So, uh, and that means the uh, carbon budget. Now here is the uh, CO2 uh, uh, in, in, I mean, greenhouse gas emissions uh, in gigatons, and this is the years. So when you do the area under the curve, that is the total uh, gigatons out in the space. So that is how I was mentioning about cumulated emissions uh, and carbon space is a major issue. Uh, in this much space, who gets how much is the uh, critical issue. Uh, so uh, uh, the model has three scenarios uh, from, for the period of 10 to 50. Uh, dynamics as usual means current policies. We have also current policies. Uh, we have uh, LED bulbs and uh, uh, 175 gigawatts by 2024 and so on. So we, have, we do have some friendly policies, but uh, ambitious action with current technology uh, is something we should do. Uh, and that's what was promised in Paris Agreement, more or less. And now we are talking about, let's go one more level and see what happens. And here we uh, gave, uh, uh, we just uh, gave the condition uh, to the model that uh, India's share should not exceed 160 gigatons. Now, that's the carbon space we gave to the model. Uh, in fact, very, what we should give carbon accumulated carbon constraint. Uh, so how does that come about? 160, I'll come in a minute. But we also include uh, only supercritical coal, hydro growth rate increase from 1% to 3%. So these are technological conditions that we gave uh, and that, that the photovoltaic uh, solar uh, energy cost drops by 70% and there won't be any uh, 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 Bound on nuclear, solar, or wind. Uh, so here is the uh, logic for 160 gigawatts mean value of RCP 2.6 scenario. This is not two degree, but 2.6 gives uh, 990 gigaton CO2 uh, over this time frame. And uh, German Advisory Council on G uh, WBGU has uh, equal per capita allocation uh, figures are there in that. And so uh, this is the available, they propose that it should be distributed equal uh, per capita. And in that case, we need to do in 160 gigawatts out of this 990. Um, 
income transfer uh, to eliminate poverty by 2030. Uh, uh, and all these conditions are also there. These are the development conditions. Everybody must have houses. Everybody must have at least one kilowatt hour per day of electricity, cooking gas or cooking energy should be there, education and health, etc. So these are development conditions. And finally, these are the results. So I think here again, most people can understand what the results are. Uh, that uh, dynamics as usual is this blue line here, uh, which is uh, exceeds uh, uh, 10 gigatons, I mean, almost uh, 13. But uh, the AMBA, which is to practically two degree compatible, uh, it goes up to seven. But when you do 1.5, it remains at five gigatons which is the current uh, US, uh, US uh, burden. Uh, uh, per capita is still not uh, uh, global average. CO2 emissions uh, in TC 1.5 fall to this, and uh, per capita is 3.2. This is not current world average still, but um, perhaps with better efficiency and so on, it may be. Uh, all right, containment of emissions despite the requirement to meet HDI indicators. So, uh, and the sector wise, uh, one finds that the transport has, has to respond a little more. Uh, uh, industries also power considerably uh, reduced in this blue scenario, uh, uh, gray. Blue is Dow and number as uh, that written there. <coughs> And energy industry. In, in terms of CO2 intensity of GDP, you recall uh, we said you reduce it by 33%. So here it is uh, less than that. Uh, but when you see the TC 1.5 degree scenario, there's considerable reduction of CO2 intensity of GDP. <coughs> the power sector um, uh, is reduced by 85%, transport by 50%. Percent households by 15 percent uh, in in comparison to the dynamics as usual. So now I uh, uh, give it to Kenneth uh, to talk about this uh, uh, as well as uh, to uh, take uh, care of his next level of issues on uh, equity and climate finance for the above. We also need technology sharing and climate finance. Over to Kirit. Are you? Can you change the? Have to stop sharing. Great. So now, thank you very much. That was fascinating. And now we'll turn it over to Karik. Karik. You know, here you can see that the cumulative of the three scenarios. And if you look from 2012 to 2050, the last column, TC 1.5, has only 119 gigatons. Whereas we had said that even share for two gigaton, two degrees centigrade for India would be 166. And a low range of which will give to 1.5 degrees centigrade would be 133. So in this scenario, while we have fulfilled our human development indicator obligations, we are able to get to this level, which is consistent with a 1.5 degree and the share, uh, fair share of India in the global climate budget. The only, uh, uh, the main assumptions are very significant fall in, in the cost of solar PV and battery technology, as well as a significant improvement in energy efficiencies. Next, please. Now, and in the same scenario, you can see the generation of by, by different sources. The bottom one is uh, dynamic as usual in 2010. And you can see that even top one, TC 1 1.5 scenario, even 2050, the coal use increases, but it is uh, much less than what it would be in the Dow scenario. And the large part of scenario then uh, is this, Coal and natural gas are the only fossil fuels used, and the remaining is nuclear, hydro, solar, and wind, and a large part of uh, energy consumption or electricity generation is done from 
what one will call non-fossil uh, sources. Next. Uh, so for India to stay within 1.5 degrees centigrade requires really climate finance. That becomes extremely critical. Other developing countries will need even more than climate finance than India. Now the question is come how to raise this in an equitable way. And that I think is, is the thrust of my rest of my talk. Next, please. Next. Uh, anyway, the, uh, based on that, uh, one thing is that, you know, countries can really be responsible for sharing the, the climate burden. And if you have it based on the contributions to the global warming, that would be the correct way of doing it, not just because as IPCC's latest report has observed, limiting human-induced global warming to a specific level requires limiting cumulative CO2 emissions. And every ton of CO2 emissions adds to global warming. And therefore we need a mechanism by which people can postpone their emission, people are encouraged to have negative emissions and the total cumulative emissions is reduced. Next. For example, there are, th I have shown three paths to net zero. We have been in recent years, all the focus is getting into when do you get net zero. But, but here you can see in that, you know, the path A reaches net zero by 2050. The blue path B reaches net zero by 2060. But if you look at the area under the curve of B, it is less than the area under the curve of A. So the emissions in B would be certainly less than the cumulative emission in A, even though it is uh, it reaches net zero 10 years later. So what one is saying is that it is really the total cumulative emission minimization should be our goal. Next. Now, uh, we have been using a false comfort from using annual emissions as a compass because with annual emissions, we are saying, okay, I'm going to reduce this and say even IEA sustainable development scenario, the last row shows that by 2050, the annual global emissions will be only 10 gigatons. And uh, uh, IPCC 2.5, RCP 2.6 says it's 12 gigatons. Next, please. But if you look at the, the cumulative emissions, what it would be, the last column, last row, uh, IE sustainable development scenario says the to total carbon cumulated would be 1,403 gigaton of CO2. We are taking it from 1990 because after 1990, when the uh, talks for Rio Earth Summit started, no country can say that they were unaware of the threats of climate change. So I think the responsibility should begin from 1990 onward. But you would see the sustainable development scenario doesn't give me a sustainable warming, it keeps on warming the, the earth even more and more. Next, next, uh, what should global action aim at? Back to Jyoti, you, can you go back one slide? Ah, minimize cumulated emissions till net zero. Countries should postpone their emissions because if I emit one ton now, it will stay, it will keep on warming for 50 years till, or 40, 30 years till 2050. Uh, but if I emit in 2050, it will warm only for one year. So it is useful to postpone emissions by one year, by as much as possible. We should encourage countries to have negative emissions so that the burden would reduce an equitable burden should be on all countries. So I'm uh, uh, acceptable to all countries should also be the case and burdens should depend on responsibility. So we are not saying that you excuse some countries. This is, we are not suggesting that you allocate uh, global carbon space. Merely we are saying next, the cumulated emissions from 1919 gigatons of CO2, you can see is, uh, is, is uh, world's is up to 2017 is on 733. 
and China is 149, United States is 147, and so on. These are the 10 topmost countries in the list ranking by 10 countries where cumulative emission by 2017 is there. I'm taking 2017 because the latest data for 2020 may not be available and you might want to, uh, to, to allocate a responsibility based on the two year old or three year old data. Next, economists favorite is a carbon tax. They will say carbon, carbon tax in 2018 you know, 12 countries with a tax rate of US dollar greater than 25 tons for CO2. Six countries had a US dollar 50 per ton of CO2. Sweden had a US dollar 140 per ton of CO2. For US suggested tax rate would be US dollar $75 per ton of CO2 if US is to reach two degrees centigrade levels. With emissions of 4.8 gigaton in 2017, even at $50, uh, tax rate, US would collect US dollar 240 billion a year. Carbon tax is not uniform across all countries, will not, I can't read the list, anyway, will, will not, not be read, acceptable. Will not be acceptable. Because many countries say that, you know, uh, for example, the US has been saying, if India and China keep doing this, increasing the share, why should I cut down my emissions? And so they all want the same treatment of all countries. Next, please. See, suppose cap and trade was also an, another thing people were suggesting, but cap and trade is not accepted as no consensus of allocation of caps. So what we are suggesting is an annual tax of US dollar one only per ton of CO2 part in the global environment space since 1990 and all countries pay. Our proposal does not require any allocation. It will incentivize countries to postpone emissions and encourage negative emissions. And its acceptability will depend on what is done with the tax revenue. So that, you know, and it will collect, it will put a much less burden on uh, uh, collecting money on US and other countries who have high carbon tax or thinking of it. Next. That high level carbon is from emissions, and this is cumulated. Uh, as per the shares in the cumulated emissions, till 2017, USA would pay US dollar 147 billion or collect that much. China, US 149. India will collect 33 billion US dollar. The annual global collection will be more than rupees 700 billion dollars. I mean, US dollar 700 billion. And that would be certainly put all the money that we need for climate change. Now, what should we do with this? A large part of it, even say 80% or more could be utilized domestically in each country to support ambitious domestic actions. So they have to show that they've really spent this much amount of money to promote mitigation or to deal with climate change, then they will get that much of rebate. A fixed share should go to the Green Climate Fund for supporting poorer countries for mitigation, adaptation, and loss and damage. And, this, and a small share should go for global governance to support innovation to ensure access to all countries by buying patents, for collective action against disasters, and for building up global resilience and for capacity building uh, in urban agriculture and food sectors. So I think, if we have something like this, then it becomes much more acceptable to countries that a one dollar per uh, per ton of cumulative stock would be more acceptable. And it has a lot of uh, nice characteristics that you don't have to allocate resources. It includes all countries, and that it has all the right kind of incentive structures. Next, next slide. Of course, there are a number of implementation challenges. First would say, how, how to allocate funds? Uh, how do you know how much people have spent on their own mitigation effort? And I think one would say that, uh, you know, GEF and CDM have worked out ways to assess what is the cost of action. And this could be used to compensate countries, whether they have uh, up to 80% of their collection whether they have spent that money or not. Timely and verifiable data is critical. However, for determining tax amount, 
One can use two-year-old data, as I have suggested. Thus, for 2020 decks, we can use emissions till 2017 or 2018. And global sinks can be accounted in updating cumulative stock. The share of global sinks will have to be allotted, allotted to countries. And we can do the same way. Then you could certainly have a, a reasonably clean mechanism available. Next. To conclude, I think a small parking fee of US dollar one for ton of carbon can collect more than 700 billion annually and raise climate finance equitably. It will incentivize countries to postpone emissions. It will encourage negative emissions and increase climate action to get more rebate. Accounting for the stock of emissions by all countries, we believe is a scientific, fair and equitable way to ensure action and raise needed climate finance. Thank you. Next. Thanks very much. Um, so now I believe we will go to Amara Bhattacharya. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, real pleasure to participate in this IEP uh, 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 seminar. Um, I also want to thank uh, my good friend Ajay Chibber for uh, inviting me, particularly because it's a real privilege and, uh, and a personal pleasure to, of course, listen to uh, uh, Jyoti and Kirit uh, having tracked their work for many years and, you know, still extremely impressed by the energy that they bring to the challenges of climate and, you know, you know, in a very rigorous way, as you have seen from the presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, so the central point that, you know, is underpinning this, this presentation is the centrality of looking at cumulative emissions, as Jyoti pointed out. And, you know, with cumulative emissions is a way to think about both, you know, what needs to be done, but also the equity issues as we have heard about. And I think that's the central contribution of this work. And I want to elaborate on it, and particularly in the following dimensions. So I want to come back to what Jyoti said, which is how does the, on the what to do, the approach, uh, you know, as she mentioned, is the big momentum right now behind a net zero goal. And if you think about a net zero goal for the world at large, uh, and you know, the one that the world has settled on is net zero by 2050, that makes sense because that, with that goal you know, is an approximation of the fact that concentrations have to get to zero. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, emissions have to get to zero in order to stabilize concentrations and assuming a reasonable path, the kind of target year of 2050 makes sense. But as both Jyoti and Kirit pointed out, that path matters. And as Kirit showed in the graph, you, you, know, you might hit to, uh, net zero by 2050 and the integral may be better than hitting uh, another path which hits uh, at 20, uh, 2050. So the important point is that let's focus on the carbon budget that the world has and how one manages the carbon budget. And I think that's an entirely valid and very important conclusion of this, of this work. And indeed, those of us who are working in the climate, on the climate agenda very much think of it in those terms. So where are we today in the international discussions based on this central proposition? So what has happened is that, you know, in Glasgow, there was a agreement that we have to settle on a one and a half degree target based on the, you know, IPCC uh, 20, uh, 2018 report, the one and a half degree report, which highlights clearly that anything more is putting us in a high risk zone. And I think it's fair to say that countries came together around therefore 
the one and a half degree target and in approximation, agreeing that we must reach collectively net zero by 2050. Advanced economies, in order to make a credible commitment to that, have particularly the G7, have agreed that they must reduce emissions by 50% by 2030 as a first step towards this goal. And I think you know, that was a, an important uh, uh, accomplishment. However, if you take the framework that Kirith and Jyoti have set out, you can conclude that advanced countries reaching net zero by 2050 is simply not good enough because it will not get us to one and a half degrees and they will have to do a lot more. In other words, if you wanted to think about the carbon budget with the kinds of numbers that, uh, that, was, that Kirith and uh, Jyoti laid out, you would have to have much more aggressive actions on the part of advanced economies. The second thing that you know, really pops out is the role of China. Okay, so what, ha what, ha what we see from the numbers is that China today accounts for a third of global emissions, uh, double that of the United States, and you know, its emissions under the scenarios will continue to increase. So China could, you know, on its present trajectory, eat up most of the remaining carbon budget that is left in the world. And so, you know, one aspect of this that's quite important to think through is what's going to be the role of China in a world where we have very limited uh, carbon space. And third, you know, the developing countries other than China who account currently for a third of global emissions given where they are in their development trajectories, and given that they account for 5.4 billion of the world's 7.9 billion, and their population will increase by 2 billion in the next 30 years, that's where you know, momentum in terms of infrastructure, in terms of energy demand will be, and they have to have, as Jyoti mentioned, the development space in order to be able to uh, you know, at the same time supporting the low carbon tr transition. And there lies, in some sense, the big issues around both equity, but also the kind of support that these countries will need in order to undertake their energy transition in a way that is that delivers on development at the same time. So let me make some observations about India as an example, and then you know, what does this imply for the global architecture in you know, bu building on what Kirith had said. So for India right now, the modeling results that uh, Jyoti uh, mentioned shows that, and, and Kirith uh, underscored, shows that it is possible for India to deliver on a one and a half degree scenario you know, on the basis of a fair share of the carbon budget while delivering its development mission. And the central point is that it, this is possible because today the low carbon pathway is actually less costly than a high carbon pathway. That's a very, very fundamental point about the feasibility of this path. It is today less costly to invest in renewables with storage than it is to invest in so-called clean coal. So in some sense, the, the requirements that India has, at least in the build out of renewables is not because renewables cost more, but because the development needs of India are very large. So that is a very important point to understand that this is not an incremental cost because of climate, it's an incremental investment because of development. It's a very, very different proposition. There are, however, important incremental costs. And those incremental costs 
are associated with accelerated phase out of coal. If India chooses to accelerate the phase out of coal, again, as Jyoti mentioned, there are a handful of states where this is concentrated. There will be financial costs associated with early closure of plants, the costs of people and places, what we call just transitions, that will be very significant. How much are those costs likely to be? And according to numbers that we've been working with, it could be in the order of 800 billion to a trillion dollars for India. So very significant costs associated with early phase out of coal. The restructuring of the existing capital base would cost a lot. The third aspect of the energy transformation is the transformation of demand, ensuring that all demand moves from fossil fuels to zero carbon energy. And the prospects for this now are very good. Why? Because it's possible to electrify a lot of things and looking at the horizon, it will be possible to actually move to green hydrogen and green hydrogen will allow us to even decarbonize hard to abate sectors. This will also require investments, but the general consensus is that the, that the savings of these investments will make it worthwhile and the policy instruments, not only carbon pricing, but also regulatory policies like the phase out of fossil fuel industry, I mean, for fossil fuel and uh, in internal combustion engines and other mandates. How much will this cost India uh, in terms of investment? And I should use the words cost carefully. How much will India need to invest in the order of six to nine trillion between now and 2050? That's a very significant sum. It's not an impossible sum. A, only a small fraction of that would you consider as incremental costs because of climate. But the financing of it nevertheless remains a challenge. And that has to relate, therefore, to both the sources of financing and you know, how we mobilize it domestically as well as internationally. So let me move to the international architecture. So I think the proposal that Kirith and Jyoti are laying out, which is let's use cumulative carbon emissions as a way to think about you know, a Pigouvian type tax, absolutely makes economic sense. There's no doubt about that. That is the best way to proceed. Now, I don't think that we need, I mean, that, that is a mo that's a mobilization of finance. It's very important to, to recognize that that tax is not the same as a carbon tax. A carbon tax is intended to influence marginal activity. So the idea is not one is a cumulative tax to raise resources, and the other is to change the incentives in terms of shifting to a decarbonized economy. So implicit there were two very different uh, you know, uh, proposals. One is let's use cumulative emissions to mobilize resources that we can use for the climate agenda. And the other is let's use carbon pricing to accelerate the shift to a decarbonized economy. On the second one, there are very, very active discussions underway right now. As countries now begin to accelerate on decarbonization, there is correctly worries about carbon leakage. So do you need a uniform tax? Most of us believe if you want to eventually have uniformity, but it's okay to have tiered tax for carbon pricing in the way that the IMF is proposing. You will need equivalence because everybody, as Chris pointed out, doesn't have explicit carbon pricing. And you will need to have some mechanisms of cross-border price adjustments. So that, I think, is an important part of the international agenda. Second, on the mobilization of finance. So as Kirit said, for just $1 on cumulative emissions, you can raise uh, $700 billion, okay, annually. Does that do the trick? And the answer is it depends. Okay. If you use the totality of that money for the developing world, 
then you would probably begin to get the adequacy of finance that we are talking about. But of course, you don't need all of it to be concessional finance. So if you think of this as a voluntary pool of finance, then I think the proposal of 80% for domestic use, 20% for international is fine. But in some sense, if you look at those numbers, they are not that different from where the existing architecture of climate finance is. So the question is, you know, do we have a basis of dismantling going to the international community and saying, you know, we want to now replace that with a completely new financing structure? I'm not sure the, the answer would be yes. We should push the argument that you need to have adequate carbon uh, uh, revenue mobilization for climate action, most of which would be domestic. And the push to carbon pricing in the way that I just mentioned would generate much more revenues than the $1 proposal that Kirith is talking about. So in some sense, you don't need, in some sense, the cumulative tax in order to mobilize revenues from carbon pricing. You know? just given the proposals on the range of carbon pricing we're talking about. In terms of the international mobilization and generating the kind of concessional finance that we need, the orders of magnitude that would, that would come from an international allocation would be very important, but there are two hurdles. One is no agreement at the international level on any kinds of transfers of carbon pricing at the moment. So the structure that we have is really the one which is around the 100 billion, which we haven't delivered, but building on that or going to a, the, a, a completely new proposal. My view is a completely new proposal at this time in the climate accords really has no chance of flying. So it's good to take the ideas and to think how would we modify the existing climate finance architecture to deliver the scale of finance that we need. How much do we need? We need a roughly an incremental amount of about two trillion a year by 2030. And there is no way that we are going to get that from concessional finance. So we have to think about two additional pools of finance, development finance and the mobilization of private finance. So in the end, I think what is important is to be able to mobilize the finance for the scale of investment that is necessary. In that, the equity considerations suggest that you must be able to have concessional finance where the costs associated with climate uh, are particularly acute, which means adaptation and resilience and loss and damage, but we will need significant concessional finance also for just transitions in large countries like India, South Africa, Indonesia, Vietnam, and the like. So I would say that your ideas are very va valid, but I don't think that they will, can provide the basis still for a complete overhaul of the climate finance architecture. So this debate will continue, but really, really good ideas here that I think will help us push both efficiency as well as equity. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. That was a great discussion. And I wanna turn it over now to our, our final speaker to Srikant Gupta, uh, the floor is yours. Very much. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Yes. Uh, okay, yeah, well, uh, obviously a wonderful, a wonderful talk both by Jyoti and by Kirit. And thank you very much for having me here. Um, I'd like to uh, make three basic points. Uh, and uh, I think I can uh, start where Amar left, which is on the, uh, the international um, architecture for climate finance. I think uh, <clears throat> he's, uh, in a way, he's right. Uh, that, uh, you know, right now to think of a very new idea Though, I mean, I must say that, uh, you know, um, Kirit being a, a brilliant mind as always has really said the right thing that if you put it in economic jargon, the climate externality is not a flow externality, it's a stock externality. 
So it's the accumulated stock. So it's very right on his part to focus on the stock nature of the problem and say that we must tax the stock. So in that sense, yes, it's a, it's a very valid point that, that Kirit made in the second half of this presentation. I'll, I'll talk about the first half after that. So the idea that you must tax the stock because that's what's causing the externality. And obviously the, the problem though, of course, becomes of redistribution. So the idea is, you know, the, these countries that uh, have not been, uh, you know, okay with this idea of cap and trade probably are not going to buy this idea either. What I want to put on the table, <clears throat> some of you must have heard about it, is the notion of a, a, a globally harmonized carbon tax, but internally levied. So starting with people like Joseph Stiglitz, who talked about it, Lately, uh, William Nordhaus, who won the Nobel Prize, uh, shared the Nobel Prize in 2018, has been talking about climate clubs. I would like to suggest, as far as uh, concepts are concerned, that rather than think of uh, a kind of a tax either on the flow or on the stock, which is somehow collected and redistributed across countries, a globally harmonized uh, carbon tax, which is levied internally, and the incentive to avoid uh, cheating is essentially through trade measures, has probably a better chance, at least conceptually, of uh, going through. Uh, there's been a considerable amount of academic work that's happening on that. And uh, like I already mentioned, uh, the, the sort of the very active area of research by William Nordhaus and uh, the integrated assessment model that William Nordhaus has been working on uh, the dynamic uh, integrated climate economy model, the DICE model, the celebrated DICE model of Nordhaus has been modeling uh, these ideas. So uh, as far as we are in the realm of ideas, I would say that uh, a carbon tax, which is levied internally, but globally harmonized uh, is probably something that we may want to, uh, we may want to think of in terms of the international uh, architecture. I'm not a climate finance person, but I'm not very sanguine about the kinds of numbers that Amar was mentioning, uh, $2 trillion, the track record so far of international finance moving across countries, at least sort of concessionary finance, give us any cause for hope that uh, anything close to that number uh, would materialize. But I think that we should probably start thinking more about the the uh, domestically levied but internationally harmonized carbon tax as probably a better way to do it. Uh, <clears throat> there are, of course, uh, several considerations, uh, domestic considerations, et cetera, that need to be thought through. But if, if uh, the um, several countries in the world, though, are pricing carbon, and if the revenues were to stay within their countries, it would probably be at least much more politically feasible than to say that we would have some sort of billions of dollars moving across borders in terms of the uh, stock, the tax on the stock of carbon or on the flow of carbon or whatever you have. So that was my first comment in terms of an alternative structure for uh, thinking about uh, international um, carbon finance. I just want to uh, like in terms of the, uh, the presentation by Jyoti, which of course uh, you know, her, her, her climate, the work that she and others have been doing on the climate model um, is, is exciting. Uh, I do a lot of climate modeling for a living. I don't want to get into the minutiae of it, but yes, it, this is a Markal type model. So, you know, obviously it doesn't really have prices in it. So there are some issues there, but I think that the value of the kind of modeling exercise that, you know, Irade is doing, Jyoti has been doing, um, is, is very useful in trying to uh, tease out these implications of you know, which sector, how much, and uh, a very detailed characterization of the economy uh, that is happening in the work that uh, you know, she and her group have been doing for so many, so many years. <clears throat> I want to focus a little bit on something slightly, slightly different, which is, you know, um, in the, in, as economists, we are obviously thinking about, um, you know, at a, at a sort of a, this is more like a social planner, you know, and Ajay talked about his time at D school and, you know, we are all 
we have some objective function and uh, by the way jyoti there was a typo it's not minimized net present value of consumption it's maximized in your slide oh. so the idea is that you are you you so we you know this whole social welfare function that we are maximizing etc but let me make it more uh, prosaic um so let me just give you some examples you know so india's nationally determined contributions the ndcs that we put in paris so forget these new things that the pm has been saying just take that and take just take one number so by 2030 we were supposed to have 100 gigawatts of of solar uh, 100 gigawatts of solar now you know you you're all experts in project finance projects are financed by 70 30 debt debt equity ratio so you need something like uh, the tune of uh, 5 lakh crores to be coming from uh, public sector banks to finance these uh, solar projects right now you know that the bad debt of indian banks are a huge problem uh, we have about one fifth of the banks loans are bad debts non performing assets as we euphemistically call them in india something like 13 lakh crores uh, and the power sector alone accounts for about 16% of our bad debt now you have this scenario where we are all talking from the technology side okay this is what's going to happen but if you think of the 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 revenue model for these uh, for these uh, solar largely solar plants where is the money going to come from you have here a renewable sector that is yet to stabilize we do re reverse auctions so essentially the project goes to the lowest bidder in terms of the uh, the the tariff that they are going to do um the power sector is already stressed we have oversupply in this entire scenario you want to pump in so much of renewable energy particularly the solar energy uh, i think you know we really we really need to think through and sort of you know uh, to use the american phrase wake up and smell the coffee about uh, how exactly this is going to happen and and really like to turn this over to people like ammar and so on and ask them that do you really think that what uh, the indian government is saying in terms of raising all this money where is this money going to come from uh, if it's going to be public sector banks and if all these uh, renewable projects go belly up ultimately it's indian taxpayer who's going to end up you know holding the baby so my and the last thing which i think is a is a it's a little uh, provocative in the realms of political economy uh, we have uh, two very large industrial houses in this country uh, which uh, are one uh, house is Uh, you know very traditional in oil and so on and is now making a big move into uh, into uh, renewables and then there is this other very big house which is already uh, uh, making a big play in green energy uh, the the double a as they have been called and the reason i thought of this was that when i was reading jyoti and kirit's very interesting article in times of india where they gave us all the reasons uh, maybe kirit should have talked about a bit more about it that look um, you know when you're going to move away from uh, coal and fossil fuels the navratnas of india are basically in those areas and uh, you're going to be moving away so there is a whole political economy of realignment uh, of economic power and so on that is uh, not maybe not uh, the subject of this discussion but it's a very interesting thing for me as an indian sitting in india to think about that how is this all going to play out in the political economy realm so to summarize my three points uh, think a little bit more about uh, globally harmonized but internally levied carbon taxes be a little bit more careful about uh, you know where the money for all our solar is going to come from and probably don't end up becoming you know having more of bad debts with our banks which are already in bad shape and third uh, maybe it's interesting to think a little bit about the political economy of a, a net zero country uh, in terms of you know how economic power and so on is going to play out thanks great thank you very much <clears throat> for uh, both those discussions i wanted to sorry <clears throat> turn it back over to our authors briefly if they had any kind of quick comments um, back to the discussions Are you asking us to speak, or yes? If you have any specific that? replies back, or oh, yeah. I could just perhaps direct you oh, yeah. in one sense: yeah. the carbon, 
both discussants raised questions about the proposed carbon tax, and there were a number of questions in the Q and A about specifics. And I wanted to maybe push on, you know, Amar's point that a cumulative tax doesn't do anything in terms of marginal incentives going forward, right? And so that that's a bit, you know, as people think about whether it's regulation, whether it's subsidies or a carbon tax, usually the thing they're thinking about is shifting incentives to change emissions on a forward-looking basis. But a cumulative tax wouldn't do that. So I, I assume in some sense, your plan would be the cumulative tax, plus it would need other things that countries are doing to try to meet their own goals because the, the cumulative tax wouldn't be helping them. And so I was wondering if you wanted to contrast that with Srikant's last comment about um, less redistribution, but more focus on a globally harmonized carbon tax that is more focused on incentives. Can I respond to this? Yes, please. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I, I think first Amar's observation is that, you know, uh, this kind of a tax doesn't give the same incentive as carbon tax does. Yes, a carbon tax within a country would give different private pay players to play the same game, you know, marginal cost is modified and therefore they will have less incentives. But at the national level, if the government has to pay this, it has an incentive to cut down carbon emitting things. So it can use other instruments to do what, what the, uh, to raise this kind of money that it has to give as a carbon tax to do on the, on, as a tax on the cumulative amount to this. So I don't see that that is really a, 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 a significant objection to our, our proposal. Uh, other thing, uh, uh, Amar said that the current system, current architecture is really raising resources, but we have seen it's not raised even 100 billion that was promised. And it's very unlikely to raise it. And all they're saying is you consider private finance as a part of this 100 billion, but private finance doesn't come in a concessional term. They come mostly at, 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 you know, to earn profit and they're certainly is, is, a, is a part of the normal trade movement. So I think this 100 billion raising through normally is not going. He is right in saying that the requirement is trillions of daughter, dollars. But you know, $1 per ton, we had said, well, we can raise it to $2 or $3 a ton. And every year you can raise $2 trillion. So this is not really a fixed amount. $1 was an illustrative one. But I think we should also understand that out of this, say $1 is there, 700 billion comes <coughs> because it's large part, 80% goes back to countries as well as to, 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 to the remaining out of 20% 20, 20 you're giving to developing countries concessional aid that then the total amount of resources flowing to developing countries are much more than just the 20% of the 700 billion collected. So I believe that yes, we can raise the tax rate from $1 to $2 to $3 and that that could raise enough resources. I am not so, so uh, sold on the current architecture. They have not been able to raise even 30, 40 billion dollars, let alone 100 billion, and let alone the two, three trillion that uh, that Amar says is required by the developing countries. So uh, we need to really think in terms of a new way. Now consider the 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 globally harmonized carbon tax. Harmonization is required because the carbon tax. Uh, if it is differential across countries, then people are worried about the competitiveness of their industries and their e economy in the, in the thing. That's why they want a globally harmonized carbon tax. Co countries can collect money themselves and so on. But I would say when globally harmonized carbon tax, it is not inconsistent with this idea of raising taxes. Globally harmonized carbon tax would not raise the resources required for transferring and helping poorer countries. So let's have globally carbonized, har uh, harmonized carbon tax. Let countries col collect the tax, 
and spend some of it, but then uh, you know contribute on that stock so that it is thin. Because that, as we said, even the the sustainable development scenario of IPCC uh, IEA still gives fourteen hundred gigaton of stock in the in the atmosphere at the end of this twenty fifty. So it is really not something that will really control warming. So if you're interested in coming warning, and I think if everybody goes to 2050, uh, zero, net zero, and then you could say afterwards, we will have negative emissions so that it will all, 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 all gradually dissipate that. That is, I think to me is a pipe dream. It is not going to happen. China is nowhere near it, and it's not likely to take land. Now, China is already, uh, the total stock we promoted by China is 300 gigatons in the, you know, and so on. So the Chinese are, are, are way ahead of everything, and they are not going to listen to anyone, whether it is uh, climate change or uh, any other issue. I think uh, similarly, I would say that uh, 80% uh, staying within the country is, is itself provide a significant amount of money to developing countries. Now, our model, uh, Shrikant says is a Markal type, but I may clarify, it is not a Markal type model. It covers the whole economy. We have an, a, 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 an econometrically estimated nonlinear demand system which gives for every income class 20, 10 rural and 10 urban, their own expenditure system, which is a, a linear approximation of the underlying nonlinear demand system. And so the demand is endogenous in the model. And that, uh, that, that, that what we get is a consistent picture of demand for power, demand for other goods, the requirement of resources for building that thing, meeting those demands and the requirement for, for the economy. So that it is a, an economically viable, I would say a technologically consistent solution that our model produces. I think uh, it is true that Ambani's and, and Adani's, they're the two large private houses. One is moving from, uh, moving into the direction of, recognize that yes, oil is on the way out, that eventually one would have to go for renewable and it is aggressively moving into renewable. The other is already moved into renewable Adani and is expanding that, that thing further. Now, I, I believe that uh, uh, the Navratnas, which are public sector units are also moving into renewables. For example, NTPC, one of the most well-functioning public sector unit, National Thermal Power Corporation, is also moving into renewables and so on. So I think uh, give the public sector man Navratna managers freedom to act and they will certainly move in the direction in which technology is directing them to go. So I do not believe that, uh, that we are going to face enormous political uh, issues uh, in, uh, in, in moving towards a decarbonized economy. Uh, finally, I would just say that uh, uh, really, I think I really ap appreciated your comment, Amar and Shrikant, and it has given us some ideas to, to do some more work in certain areas. Okay. Thank you very much. I wanted to okay. ask one other question that, that came out um, broadly in many of the, the Q&A questions, which was about feasibility of some of the assumptions. And so in particular, um, at least if I understand it, the, the scenario with the technical change that does hit the 1.5 uh, degrees, you know, one of the questions people often have with these is how feasible are the assumptions that go in there? What type of technological yeah, assumptions? I, I would be two, two, two critical assumptions. One is that the rate at which the cost of uh, power sector uh, particularly solar PV and batteries are coming down. Now, we had looked at the pro pro uh, projections made by various international organizations and taken an 
slightly less optimistic view than these productions, these numbers tell. So in terms of the cost reduction that we have assumed, I think we are on track. I don't think they were unreasonably uh, optimistic. They're actually less optimistic than what is done by IRENA or Frauenhauser or other international organizations, including I would say NRDC and so on. Uh, I would say that the, the other critical assumption is the rate at which uh, energy efficiency can, can cut, get down, cut down the demand for energy uh, requirement here. And similarly, the whole economy, it, it per perbulates. Now, considering uh, we had looked, done a detailed study of how, let's say, labeling has affected people's behavior in India in terms of uh, buying a three-star or a four-star uh, equipment compared to one-star one. And we had uh, again empirically seen the results were satisfy satisfactory that a significant amount of people are moving to energy efficient things. It's a question of labeling and giving enough information to people. And I think we are moving in that direction. So I think the energy efficiency assumptions we have made are also consistent with it. We have had a 1%, more than one and a half percent reduction in energy intensity, intensity, and we have taken less than that in our projections. So I think uh, our detailed papers give this background information, but in this we didn't present this because otherwise we'll get lost in only those things. Thank you. Um, so we just have a few minutes left. I wanted to maybe uh, pose one question that, that came out in the Q&A a number of times um, to, to each of the panelists, if everyone just wanted to have one minute to kind of sum up. And it really came to, there's a very big emphasis today on a carbon tax in one form or another as, as a solution, both on the revenue side and on the incentive side. And there were some questions in the chat of, is, is this the only choice? Are there other Roots, whether it's on the incentives or on the revenue side, that might be an alternative to a carbon tax. And I, and I think it's a relevant question, as you see, you know, in some countries where politically carbon taxes have struggled a great deal, the United States being a good example, where instead there's been a push towards using regulation and subsidies as opposed to a carbon tax. Do you see a carbon tax as necessary for the, the way you're viewing this? Or is it just one? tool that, that could be used and, and you see it as an effective tool. Maybe we could kind of go in reverse order of, of the order we spoke. So we could start with uh, Shrikant. Well, you're, you're talking to an economist, so <clears throat> I mean, it's, uh, the, but you know, more seriously, see the point is that um, the word, just think of a carbon price. And I think all of us are saying that carbon has to be priced. This is a problem. So whether you want to call it a carbon tax, a cap and trade, or whatever else you want to call it, unless we have, and I don't see why anybody would have a problem with pricing because we, no, no matter what our ideological persuasion, we live in a market economy where we buy and sell, we are consumers, we make decisions on the basis of uh, incentives and price signals. So if we are going to consume a, a resource, uh, if you're going to consume the planet's um, capacity to hold carbon, then why should we not think of pricing it? Why should it be free? If I'm, if I'm just to put it in very simple terms, I, if, if there are you know, people out there in this, in this audience who are listening, you know, I mean, and it, this is very commonsensical, I'm driving a car, I'm paying for the gasoline or the petrol, uh, why would I not, should I not pay for the emissions uh, that my car is producing? Forget carbon tax, just think of a, a charge on, on the kinds of air pollution, et cetera, that's happening. So I think pricing is a very, uh, it's, it's sort of a, I would almost say an article of creed when we think of, uh, you know, dealing with externalities and those sorts of things. Now, the question, of course, is of the political economy. It's a question of the, 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 the distributive implications, but these are nothing new. These have been done for a long time. There is a whole notion called double dividend, as some of us know here, that you could be levy, levying certain kinds of uh, taxes on activities such as CO2 and so on, and uh, maybe reducing the, uh, the, the burden of other kinds of distortionary taxes. So there's a kind of a win-win, the green taxes, if you will. 
So I don't see carbon tax, the car pricing carbon as something untouchable. And I don't think that without, and so I really think that's the piece that's missing in this whole conversation, lots of very good engineers and, and you know, energy planners and so on. But particularly if I'm sitting in, in India and I can tell you that one group that's really missing from conversations on what to do about climate are, are economists essentially, who are talking about pricing carbon in some shape or form. We do need to do it, whether how we, how we do it is, is an important question. The petrol in, in, in India went over 100 rupees a liter and a large part of it was excise duty. So in a way, it's an implicit tax. It's a, you can call it a carbon tax. You can call it what you will. So I don't see a way around uh, us uh, escaping the signals of pricing through this. Um, and I, 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 Kirit is right. These are not mutually exclusive, but I'm, I'm sorry. I just want to finish very quickly yeah, at this point, sure. I know. Uh, but, but the idea simply is this, um, Jay and others, that uh, uh, I don't, I'm not sanguine that countries, the, the rich countries are going to redistribute billions of dollars to us. So we do need a globally harmonized system, whether it comes around, I don't know. Uh, my only point, the one that I don't think anybody picked up on uh, was this whole issue of uh, our, our, our solar energy projects in India financially viable. I'm very worried about that. So, and I think Amar is here and of course, Kirit and Jyoti, all, you know, the finest minds working on this. Um, I think we really need to worry about our public sector banks financing solar energy and going belly up which they already are. Sorry, that was not your question, but I wanted to sneak that in again. <laughs> sure. So we're we're actually uh, just over time. So um, if uh, Mar or Kirit or Jyoti have a kind of quick comment uh, to wrap up. Jyoti, Amar. you should ask Jyoti too. Her, her yeah, no, I, I was just uh, a few comments uh, straighten out, uh, straightening out some few things. Uh, well, uh, many models are developed uh, about uh, uh, pathways and so on. But I think very few are uh, reporting carbon budget. Sometimes they have carbon constraints uh, or even net zero uh, are not respecting carbon budgets. They say, well, well we, will, we reach net zero, but, but what is the carbon you emitted uh, all this time? Did you minimize it? That's not the, uh, uh, that's usually not the case. So that's one thing. Second is, um, uh, one dollar was an illustrative uh, thing. Uh, you can think of 1.5, 2, 3, uh, whatever uh, amount is needed uh, to, to get a job done. And uh, as Kirit explained, uh, this is the global responsibility uh, towards uh, aggregating the kitty, but inside your country, you can uh, raise any way you like it. And uh, certainly uh, uh, the difference between uh, I mean, we are in India, we are uh, uh, having such a huge carbon price in our petrol and diesel uh, that, um, in fact, uh, you know, it, it, it's something that people are not even charged in the United States, what we are charging in, uh, for one liter of petrol, so, uh, uh, or, or many other places. So, uh, there is a, a, a carbon price there uh, that people are paying. And you can call it tax or price, but it is it is, uh, it is a price uh, because people are making decisions on that basis. Uh, about the private sector and public sector, I would say that <clears throat> when Reliance, Adani, NTPC, and now Tata Power and many others who have joined, it actually shows that uh, you know you you don't have to worry as much. As uh, because they they know the it's, they are not doing because government is saying so and they are uh, expecting to make money they are uh, their IPOs are over subscribed Adani Green and so on and uh, you know it is already uh, forty percent higher than when it was launched just a few months back uh, so uh, you cannot uh, say that uh, they are banks money and they will be bankrupt and all that, it, 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 it has some economic sense uh, and people are, when we are talking about shifting to, you just imagine that uh, the entire value chain, and it, in fact, that's another worry. I'm not saying that everything is hunky uh, but uh, so much uh, uh, mining and processing and transporting and all these uh, are eliminated when you do solar. So that's what makes it, uh, 
makes it uh, uh, profitable. It's not a totally unprofitable business uh, as you worry, but I think in India we have to worry because of the institutional structure, the way discoms are uh, uh, structured and and people they can not be not paid and so on this side of because uh, politicians have decided that they are going to give free electricity. So all these are political problems. I agree, but uh, it's not that uh, renewable energy per se. Uh, has the problem? It would that problem would remain if politicians keep promising free electricity. So uh, that that's a separate issue uh, that we cannot uh, discuss right now altogether. Yeah. Great. Thank you. I think we're going to need to stop there because we're quite a bit over time. But I think we can um, follow up uh, conversation uh, with the panelists um, just, afterwards. You've got a link. Can so I just say one sentence? Sure. To, to Shrikant's, Shrikant's comment, I think as an economist, one should take the scarcest commodity. And the scarce commodity is not carbon emissions. The scarce commodity is global environmental space. OK, so with that, um, thank you very much to our, our presenters and to our fantastic discussants. That was a, a very rich conversation and a really interesting one. And so thanks to everyone for your questions in the Q&A. And please, as I said before, please take a look at the website to see uh, further events coming up in this Envisioning India series. Thank you.